Okay. Let's start the webinar. Okay. We'll just give a couple seconds for everyone to join. And you can still see my screen, correct? Okay. All right. Well, since everyone's joining in so quickly, we'll start now. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this professional learning opportunity. I'm Angela Lazar, Digital Project Coordinator from NCEA, and I'll be facilitating this webinar today. Just a few housekeeping notes as everyone's joining in. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A box. You just have to hover your mouse over the screen and you'll see a Q&A box on the bottom and you can submit your question on there. And we will monitor the questions as the presentation is going along. So don't be afraid to ask a question at any time and we'll get to any questions that we've missed at the end. And at the end of the session, I'll provide a link to a survey that has a certificate of completion for the webinar. And um, that should take no more than five minutes to complete. So I'll put the link in the chat and you'll have access to it. And um, for today's webinar, Mid-Season Boost, five marketing tips for enrollment for Catholic schools and dioceses. We'll give you five tips to help you analyze what's working and what's not, as well as ways to dive in to the community to gain traction and engage with prospective families within your community. Join us for this information pack session to elevate your school's enrollment efforts immediately. So here are our wonderful marketing leaders from Community Brands, and we'll have them introduce themselves. Hi, thank you for having me here today, and welcome to the five ways to boost enrollment during mid-season. I'm excited to be here today to share some of the things I've learned and applied over my last 20 years in marketing. A little bit about myself, I'm the Director of Demand Gen for K-12 at Community Brands. I live in Minnesota and I'm a proud mom of three boys, but I'm not here alone. You can see I'm here today with my colleague, Shauna Abner. She's our K-12 product manager and former director of enrollment. So she comes here today to walk you through things and share her story a little along the way. So Shauna, can you just say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, like Amber said, my name is Shauna and I'm on the product marketing team here at Community Brands. But before I was on the product marketing team, I was in your role as an enrollment director at some of the local schools here in my area. I'm in Seattle. Um, and so I'm sitting now today in a different role, but understand all the pains that you guys face in your role. So I'm happy to be here with you. Great. Thank you so much. We're so happy to have you here and we're so excited for your presentation. But before we begin, we will start in prayer. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, good and gracious God, we pray that the focus and foundation of our Catholic schools will always be the person of Jesus Christ. May we remember that we are called to work together as part of your universal church to build your kingdom in our midst. Let each of our Catholic schools be recognized by its commitment to excellence, its efforts to form the whole child, its hospitality toward all, and its intentional development as a community of faith, collaboration, trust, and love. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining us today. And you can go ahead and begin your lovely presentation. Wonderful. If you can go to slide three, please. Great. You are now around five months or so into the school year, and I want to talk about stepping back and doing a little bit of a mid-season enrollment check. So I don't know if any of you have been doing this, but some questions you th should consider thinking about are things about discussing things with your colleagues and asking yourself, like, are you falling short on your enrollment goals? Are you thinking about what you can do to boost enrollment? Have you looked at your data to see what's working or not working? And have you thought about maybe doing a winter open house? So those are some of the things we're going to walk through today. It's not too late to start thinking about it. Um, we're here to give you actually five tips in this session. And we'll talk about at the end, uh, you know, any questions you have. So feel free to pop questions in while we go and we can be interrupted. That's fine. And we'll just get started. So starting with tip number one. 
So on tip number one, we're going to go into the next slide and start really talking about the outreach of understanding your target audience. So I put this slide in here to do a little bit of illustration of the makeup of the people that are um, the parents that you're going after. So most students entering elementary have millennial parents. So it's important to understand the difference between them and the Gen X specifically. So you can see the two columns in the first and the second one. That's where we're going to keep our focus here a little bit. I put Gen Z in here so that you understand that those are the students that are currently in the schools today. But millennials are the largest generation. They are racially and ethnically more diverse, and they have high rates of education attainment. They are most likely to have split households too. And as you can imagine, technology is essential for them. While most children entering elementary school will be offsprings of millennials, children entering middle and high school will be the offspring of those Gen X parents. But when we're communicating with the parents, it's good to understand how they think and what motivates them. And that's why I put this slide in here today. Because did you know that Gen X, they're comfortable with authority, they're independent, they're hard workers, and they have a work-life balance, and they're very digital oriented. Millennials respect must be earned, they are goal and achievement oriented, and they want freedom and flexibility. They are the digital natives. And that's why we're here today to talk about marketing and how it can work for them. It's important to have good understanding of this and the differences. So do me a favor when we're done with this presentation, share this slide specifically with some of the people in your organization so that they know when they're communicating to some of these Gen X and millennial parents that they understand how they think and the things that motivates them. So let's go on to the next slide here. So did you know that 58% of millennial parents versus 46% find information provided to them to be overwhelming? Making decisions, as you know, can be difficult, and the way they review and digest the information is different. Millennials, as I stated, are researchers, so they're doing their due diligence to find out information on their own before asking someone. So they are constantly on the internet, they're on their phones, they're searching for information. Your job as a marketer in your school is to make your message digestible and clear so that it's easy for them to understand. So my tip is to take some time and look through your website content, your blogs, your social posts, any announcements you're making, and see if it's lengthy or is it quick information that they can quickly gather and make a decision based off of what they see. You can also ask for feedback from parents. Ask them, you know, have you been on a website lately? Does it share the right message for you? Does it um, help you to make decisions that you're looking for? Is there things missing from our website? It's great to get feedback from others to see how well you guys are doing. With these two primary target audience, it's good to keep in mind that too many sources and resources that they go through lead them to stay with their current choice. So they want that information quick and easily. They don't want to be overwhelmed. So just keep that top of mind as we kind of go through some of these things today. So I wanted to start here by shaking it up a little with a poll. So um, if you could, I want you to see what social media, oh, this is the wrong poll. Sorry, that's popping up here. Um, the, what I really want you guys to know is how often do you look at your website analytics? Is the so, right one appearing? Yep, the right one's yes. appearing. Thank you. Perfect. So how often are you guys looking? Are we constantly monitoring? Do you look at them every few months? Do we look at them annually? Or we never look at and don't know how? If you could just take a minute to answer that, that'd be great. Yeah, the numbers are still going here. Perfect. Um, do you, can you view the results or would you like me to read them? I'd like you to review them, please. No problem. So right now at 40 seconds in, we have uh, very similar numbers between, we are constantly monitoring we look at them every few months and we never look or don't know how. And they're ranging between the 28 to 31 percent. These are like okay. the top three. OK, perfect. We can go on to the next slide then. OK, I'm glad to see that we're kind of all over the place. That Some of you that are on this call today, you're constantly monitoring and that's great. So I hope you get some tips 
on things to look for on your website coming out of this. The ones that look at it periodically or not at all, I'm going to give you some tips of what to be looking for as well as um, what tools to use to be finding out how things are performing for you. So as we start to understand how parents engage, web analytic tools such as Google Analytics are software designed to track, measure, and report on website activity. So including your site traffic, your visitor source, and user clicks. So using web analytic tools helps you to understand what's happening on your websites. And so those of you that aren't really looking at it very often, you should really start to look at utilizing the tool of Google Analytics. It's a free tool, if you didn't know this. You can download it and easily start using it today. You just have to align it with your URL that you're using on your website. And what's great about this is you can see how people are engaging with your website. You can see what pages they are on. You can see what type of conversations they are having. And it's really important for you to use the tool to understand what makes people motivated on your website. So one part of Google Analytics that's good to look at is how long you are having people staying on your website. So time on page, you can see how long they're staying there. If they're getting off within seconds, the information wasn't important to them. So that's something you really wanna take a good look at. So for instance, if your admissions information page has a high bounce rate, look at some of the content and the order in which you put it on your page. Make sure the most important information on that page is up at the top because it'll be sticky and it'll stay with them. So it's so important for you to create a mix of pictures and text and make them page user friendly and make sure there's when they click on something, it brings them to the right information. It's always good to double check that as well and identify what are the opportunities for you amongst those pages. We look at things on a weekly basis here. I encourage you to do the same. I know it's hard at times to figure that out, but if you can just get one employee to focus on doing a quick, you know, 30 minute at the most check and look at that analytics page, it is going to help feed you with the information that you need to make your website successful. So let's go on and start talking about now that you've analyzed your work, how do you leverage the learnings from your website? So you review that message, like I said, you look at how you talk about your upcoming events. Is it straight to the point? Is it getting them what they need? If not, what could you do to promote it more? Do you need some more word of mouth? Do you need to do some advertising? Do you need to bring flyers home with the students? Do you need to use an app so that people know that you have events going on? What is there things that you can do to engage with people coming back to your website and visiting it more often to engage with you and getting the up-to-date information? You do not want things to be stagnant, so do not update it just once a year. On a quarterly basis, I would update some information, especially on your homepage. That is going to be the most viewed page when you go in there and look at your Google Analytics. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about optimizing it for mobile. Have you thought about looking to see if people can engage well on a mobile phone? More than 50% of internet sessions are done using a mobile device. It shouldn't surprise you. And if it does, make sure you're looking at your website to see what people are doing. So why is mobile responsive so important? A responsive website has a fluid and flexible layout, which can adjust according to your screen size. So when you go in and take a look at it, make sure you're always testing it on your mobile phone to make sure that it is scaling to size for your mobile phone. If some of the content's coming off, you need to work with your web designer and make sure that they have it scalable so you can optimize it, their browsing experience. If they're on their mobile and they're scrolling forever, you wanna get that fixed too. That means your content's too long and it's not mobilized or not accessible for your mobile app. So please, please look at that. Look at how well it's in your, your mobile is set up and it's optimized. Um, I think it's a, a step that people forget to take. They do all these updates on their website and then they get to their mobile app and they don't even think of, or excuse me, their mobile phone and they don't think to even look at the scalability of it. So a little stats here on mobile apps. In 2023, the US, there were more than 310 million smartphone users. So does your school have a mobile app you guys are using? 
And that's why I was stating earlier with the mobile app versus the mobile phone, because a school app is a great way to promote clear communication between your school and your parents. So if you have an event coming up, you can notify them on the mobile app. We know that parents are very busy. Um, they don't have a lot of time to call in if their child is going to be absent or late. Taking the time to book evening slots of scheduling time to chat with their child's teacher can be inconvenient if they don't have an app. So using a school app like the one that we've created of parent apps gives you, a, you, your parents, the full control and the convenience in their child's education. So don't be missing out on it. It's something that they that is needed. It's what parents want. It's what people interact with. And they'll probably start interacting with the mobile app once they are enrolled in your school more than they would with being on your website for content. So some of those things can carry over to your app as well when you're making announcements and such. So if you don't have a mobile app, you can drop us a note in chat or we're happy to come and connect with you and let you know more about information with our parent apps at school as well. So going on to the next slide, now's the time for us to have a poll around social media. So let's see if we can get this poll to work this time. Wonderful. Okay, so which social media platform do you leverage the most for outreach to families? Is it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, or anything other than that? You could just drop your, your stuff in the poll. That'd be great. Yeah, this is really interesting. We're having a lot of responses right now. We're about to hit 60, so I'll give it a second. Great. Uh, okay, it seems like most people have answered, and the highest result is Facebook, okay. and the second result is Instagram. Perfect, perfect. That seems common. Those are common places where people are, and that's where parents probably are spending the majority of their time, especially in the evening. Um, so it's great if you guys are on Facebook or Instagram. So communication methods and channels are the vessels to getting your message out there. And one way to do this, as we see, is they will stumble upon your website. And how did they get there? Well, they need to get there through other resources. And that's why we bring up Facebook and Instagram. You may still be sending out direct mail for tours and open houses, and that's fine because you need more than one way to generate um, people coming to these events. And not all the time, technology isn't the key thing that can work for them. So it's good to budget and adjust your budget accordingly. So on the next slide. I we do have a question. Oh, yes. Uh, our qu the question is, at a typical Catholic elementary school, who is usually responsible for monitoring website analytics? So typically it should be the person in the marketing role or in the tech, like IT could be looking at it. Um, Shauna, do you have any, any other advice for somebody that could be looking at it? I mean, we all know that, you know, our Catholic schools range in size, right? And so we range in um, the size of our offices even. So for those small shops where the admission director is the only person um, responsible, sometimes we're responsible for our admissions and marketing. So that would be lie in the admissions office. But sometimes uh, we do have to rely on our IT uh, folks to help us with those analytics. And for the most part, they are usually familiar with doing that. So it could either be, if you have a dedicated marketing person, it would lie with them. If you are just a small shop and you are responsible for admissions and marketing, it should lie within your department with maybe some assistance from the IT folks. Yeah, and one thing to consider, if you're not used to using Google Analytics, it is very easy. So it's not like you're gonna to have to go and search a ton of things. If you're a first time user of Google Analytics, you can go on, I gave a link in here, you go to the Google Analytics. They actually have a course in there that you can take that helps you self learn how to use Google Analytics. And a dashboard is built. And on that dashboard, it'll show your top pages viewed. It'll show how many people in the last month and you can just sort by date on there. Um, so if you think that, oh, it could be overwhelming for an individual, they get in there one time and they're tech savvy and have utilized, you know, any type of technology tool, they should be able to really understand what's coming out of there. So I would encourage anybody, there's YouTube videos on it. 
Um, but if you don't have the resource of a marketing person or an IT person and feel like as an admission enrollment person, you're going to be a little overwhelmed, it, it really it shouldn't be overwhelming for you. It should be a quick 30 minutes, if that, that you can see it in a week. That's a great question. Thank Any you. other questions? Uh, so far, no, that was the only one. Thank okay. you so much. Great. Thanks for the question. Um, so here's some research that I found on most schools. They spend two to 8% of their annual budget and half of their time getting new families to their schools. I don't know if you find this true for yourself, but these numbers could be good or they could be bad, depending on what you're currently doing today. You're not investing in things like advertising, marketing, consulting, marketing tools, or things of that sort. Two to 8% of your budget is likely being wasted. So on the other hand, if you are investing in marketing and you're not investing enough, if you fall within that two to 8%, ideally schools should be sending about 15% of their budget for marketing their school to sustain growth. So just think about those numbers a little bit. If you set up your marketing to work for you, that 50% of time will be optimized to your maximal potential here. All right, so let's talk a little bit about those strategies and why I asked about what you guys are using for social. So I don't think you'll find it odd that 86% of millennials are on Instagram and the X, which is used to be Twitter. Um, Twitter, they're on there for other reasons and I would not encourage you to spend a lot of your marketing efforts and putting things on Twitter, but just wanted to show you high level of where people are exploring things. So the fact that most of you are on Instagram is fantastic. Now those Gen Xers, 76% of them are on Facebook and Instagram. So you guys are right where you need to be. Um, so what is becoming obsolete though and something to keep in mind is that millennial column they are not on Facebook very much anymore. So if you are on Facebook only and go back to the presentation and see if a lot of them fall in that millennial category for your parents, you might wanna consider putting up an Instagram page. And you can just do weekly updates on there. You can do things where you showcase your school and the kids' involvement and what are some special product projects they're doing. Is there a uh, a science project that you want to portray on there that they're doing and get more engagement that way. People love to see their children and what they're doing. So it's good to engage in that way and they can share things out. And when they're sharing things out, if you don't have some of their friends who potentially could be candidates for coming to your school, that's a great opportunity for them to showcase and see all the fun things you're doing. And in your marketing materials, you can start promoting your Facebook and your Instagram pages and share with them whether what you're doing and tell them to share as well and follow and, and follow you wherever you're going and what you guys are doing because it's all about that. It's social engagement. So if you're having an open house, make sure it's always put on Facebook and Instagram. Um, that is going to be a way for you to get new enrollment. It just utilize those two social networks. Um, Amber, great increase from that. Yeah, we have a uh, a quick question. Okay. Uh, someone, someone wanted to know if they can request more information on the suggested parent apps that you recommended. Yeah, um, absolutely. If they just want to um, drop an email um, to you, or they can drop to Shauna or myself, um, we'd be happy to get you that information. So um, my email is amber.warner, W-E-R-N-E-R, -E -E at communitybrands.com, or they can just send you a message as well. We'd be happy to okay. do that. I can drop it in the chat. You said it was amber.warner at communitybrands.com, correct? Correct. Yep. I just put it in the chat here. Um, yeah. Let me know if you can outreach. see it. Um, also, this webinar is recorded and all the attendees will be emailed the recording of the webinar. Just wanted to let you know. <laughs> Wonderful. You. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about, um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So we've been talking a lot about things that can be fairly cost neutral, but you can also invest in paid advertising on social media. And I wanted to put that in here because a lot of people don't know that you can um, create posts and polls and ask questions and manage events to con connect with parents and students through social. And advertising is an example of a way you can do that. And you can track your campaign success 
and identify similar audiences and remarket to them. So you can see in this slide here, it's probably not as, as big as I would like it to be for you guys, but you can see here that there is a geographical area that you can hone in specifically through paid on either Facebook or Instagram, and you can start marketing your schools to them. So as you're on Facebook personally, and you see some of those sponsored ads that come up, or you see um, any type of promotions that come up and you're like, how, how are these people finding me? It's, paid, it's through paid ads. So what they're doing is they're paying to find you ge geographically and advertise to your likes. So if someone's already following your page or following pages like your school, your ads can pop up for them. So this is something to keep in mind if you wanna get really into targeting and putting some spend behind it. Um, it does take time. So it's not gonna be instant results. I'll tell you that right now. You know, We want instant gratification, but it, it does take time to put some money against it and start getting a pool of people around your, your geographical area in order to get um, your leads to come in for enrollment. So just wanted to make sure that I put it in there. Um, but, you know, who do you target? Like, how would you know who to target? Using existing enrollment data will tell you who you need to go to. So you can ad identify it through your existing enrollment data. So like our TADS and our Ravenna product that we have today, it has numbers that report out from it, right? So it's data that you can pull from the software. Once you get your data, you can look at the ages of students, the income, the locations, ethnicity, religion, race. And you can start to develop who your target audience is. You can input it into Facebook and it'll start to pull in those individuals that match. So using data that you have existing today through your SIS really helps you to be informed of who to target. And that's across website and that's across using it across social as well. Okay, so let's look at who we should connect with. So parents want to know how your school connects with their students as well as their community as a whole. So sharing content on your classrooms, teachers, students, created content is, is important. So I mentioned this earlier. I said it's important for you to put things on there if they have social posts on your art shows or events you're doing, extracurricular activities, band concerts. So it's not all about selling all the time, right? So it's about promoting your school in ways of engagement and what people do and why people love your school. So you could even create a highlight reel and share your favorite moments of your school. And especially around the time when it's time to get new enrollment, it's really great to showcase why they should come to your school. So if you feel like you are small and you don't have capacity to do this yourself and you are at the high school level, even middle school, kids know how to do this. So make it a part of their curriculum. Maybe you could have it as part of um, something you share with the school as a contest. How, how, you know, create a highlight reel, give them rules of engagement and have them come back with some options for you. Then you highlight your students, you highlight some of their creativity and you don't have to do it yourself. So it's a great thing to do to get kids to engage and tell them why they love their the school. So referrals really happen through word of mouth, right? So they can say, I saw my friend on this TikTok. It was a wonderful video of them. They love this school. Mom, I want to go to this school too. So kids get talking, parents get talking, and you can utilize it as part of your school. Another thing I'm guaranteeing you have quite a few of your parents that are in marketing or something like that. It's a volunteer opportunity too. So maybe you have a volunteer that volunteers to do your social posts for you moving forward. That's a great opportunity for them to get engaged with your school and to help you in that, that sense as well. Okay, so let's go and talk about blogs. If you are not blogging today, you should because blogs are easy to do and it's all about promoting your school or promoting the things that you're doing that makes you stand apart from others. Blogs can, should only be 400 to 500 words and it's really to let parents in your community know what your school are doing. So based on topics, you can infuse links into your blogs. So never post a blog without linking it to something else on your website. That keeps people engaged on your website. So for instance, if you are doing a post about um, your social studies class and the things that they're doing and highlight elements of the class, 
you can also then link within there to one of a paper that you have wrote, have written recently or showcase a teacher potentially and link it to another landing page within your website. So there's a lot of opportunities to do links within your blogs. And I encourage you guys to do that because it keeps people on your website longer. If you do not have a place for people to subscribe to a blog, I encourage you to do that as well. Every website has this capability in their back end of the website and you can turn on a button and it's a little call out that says subscribe today to get more blogs. So make sure you do that for a blog or a newsletter and you can get more people to engage with your, your content. All right. So that was a quick review on some of the tips around marketing your school, social, um, your website. But I want to pivot to um, boosting your enrollment during the mid-season. And what are some events and partnerships that you can do? So this is where Shauna comes in. And she's going to engage and tell us some of the things that have worked for her when she was the former director of enrollment. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Shauna. Thank you. So I know like as we sit in this role, sometimes, you know, marketing, when we think about marketing, it can be super overwhelming with all the little um, nuts and bolts pieces that we have, all the analytics, you know, the blogging, um, making sure that everything that you have is mobile friendly, all of those things. But what I'm going to talk to you about is more like boots on the ground marketing. So we're looking at our numbers and we're saying to ourselves, shoot, we are not where we need to be. What can we do to help boost um, those enrollment numbers? I know that a lot of you guys do winter open houses, but I want to make a call out to those winter open houses are um, good ways to invite folks onto your campus um, after you've looked at your numbers and you think you need to do a little bit more. For me, what I want to talk to you guys today about is not just you know the big uh, open house that we traditionally think of with all the balloons and the fanfare and the planning and the you know um, uh, something in the gym and something in the library and all of those things. I'm thinking about those smaller events that you can pull together really quickly. Um, I know a lot of our schools um, do a winter open house that coincides with Catholic Schools Week, um, for example, or because this year we had Celebrate um, or Discover Catholic Schools Week, and then we will have Celebrate Catholic Schools Week. Um, we might have an event during that Celebrate Catholic Schools Week. But what I started to see over a couple of years, the past couple of years that I worked in my Catholic school was that whenever we held those events um, during Catholic Schools Week, it was a lot of our current families who were showing up and not so much our prospective families. So I decided to pivot from um, the traditional winter open house to a different open house. And we would do something different during Catholic Schools Week that really did celebrate our current families. So we would do smaller events that were um, based around some event that we were having on campus, right? So we would do either um, a caroling event on campus and we would invite the community or prospective families to that, or if there was some kind of play that we were doing during the winter, or even a sporting event that we would do during the winter, we would just invite prospective families to that. We didn't have to go out and do all the food and all the balloons and all the things that you know typically come with the open house, but we would run tours with our student ambassadors or with our parent ambassadors to walk folks around the campus while things are going on. One thing we know about open houses are sometimes it feels like the buildings and our buildings, of course, because they're Catholic schools, some of our buildings have been around for a hundred years. They feel like the building is cold and it's um, um, dark and there's no one there, right, for the open house. But if you do your event around or do your open house around an event on campus, then the campus is naturally lively. So if you don't have a winter event planned, I would encourage you to do so. And it doesn't, again, have to be that big coffee, food, balloons, like lots of people coming in on a Saturday. It could be around one of your events that you have going on, whether that is a basketball game that is against uh, one of your big rivals or some kind of event that you're doing for the holidays or your Christmas tree lighting. Um, 
or Christmas decorations outside every year at my school, we would decorate the outside of our school and turn the lights on um, at a specific, you know, on a specific date. And we would invite the community to come out to our lighting of our block. Um, it was a block lighting party that we would have. So I would encourage you guys to do something during the winter. It doesn't have to be big scale. It can be small scale. And I think um, those events are always, they feel natural. You can have people on campus and it feels good and you're showing them, you know, your facilities and your kiddos or your parents who can walk them around. So if you don't have one, maybe think about putting one on your calendar. So that's the winter open houses. And then you can um, move the slide forward. The second thing um, I started to do in my last year was I was looking around for something the other schools weren't doing, right? So I got into a few local sponsorships. Um, and of course, the year after I did my sponsorships, a few other, I saw a few other schools getting on board too. So something's only new for a year. We know that to be true. So let's walk, talk through a few of those um, local sponsorships. The one I loved the most was sponsoring a sports team, a local sports team. So I called around to our soccer teams, Little League, our baseball, Little League teams, our Little League um, basketball teams, because it's winter sports, right? Um, the baseball teams are getting ready for the spring sports. So they're starting to get their, their pieces out. Um, fall, I did soccer for fall. But um, they're always willing to take on a sponsor and they don't care where the sponsor really comes from as long as it provides, you know, some uh, financial, a lot of those uh, groups use it for financial support to pay, you know, the fees for some kids who can't afford the fees or equipment or whatever. So just take the opportunity to call around to some of these little league sporting folks and um, see if they're interested in sponsorships from your school. Now, the ones that I called, of course, a lot of our kids participated on these local Little League teams, right? So our baseball, local Little League baseball team, I mean, had so many kids in so many of the age groups from our school. We were one of the biggest Catholic schools in the area with over 600 students, K through eight. And so a lot of the teams were full of the kiddos that uh, went to our school. So they were very familiar with our schools right around the corner from their main um, field. And they were over the moon that we wanted to pull out a sponsorship. And that sponsorship included a banner that would hang on their fence, right? Or a banner that hangs in the gym if it's for basketball. Um, and it's just an opportunity for you to say more than we're just here in the community, but we also support the community. So that was a great opportunity for us. Um, oh, go back, one more thing I wanted to say. Um, other than the sponsorships, we also did um, website takeovers of local magazines. So if you guys have Parent Map um, in your area, we would do call them up and ask them how much how much would it be for us to do just a one day local takeover of your website, and that would include like you see the Epiphany School the banner on the front page um, for the day there, or we would do a takeover on Niche um, and make sure that we had a profile on Niche, right? So Niche is that. Um, website that families can go to if they're looking for the best Catholic school in the area or the best independent school in the area. Niche is probably the first thing that will pop up. And you just want to make sure that you have a profile on um, that website as well. So these are just a few little things that you can be doing that's kind of a little bit outside of the box, um, a little bit different from what other people are doing. I really highly encourage you guys to look into sponsorships because not a lot of schools do them, but there's a lot of opportunity there. So. Great, thanks, Shauna. Of course. So not gonna go through each of these individually. I hope you had some good takeaways from today. When we looked at the website, looked at and talked about segmenting your list using tools that exist today through finding your enrollment data using the different marketing channels, plan and coordinate that winter open house and the local sponsorships was such a great tip, especially utilizing partnerships like that. So we hope that you enjoyed this session today. We're open to any questions right now um, that you may have about anything that we talked through today. Um, so I'll open it up to that. 
Thank you so much. Um, my apologies about the technical difficulties. Every time I move my mouse, it would like ac accidentally move the screen. <laughs> so, um, but right now it appears that we don't have any few, any questions. Um, I know we had some, but regarding uh, people maybe following up with you, would you mind if I, because I send out an email to everyone who participated today with the recording, do you mind if I also include one of your emails in that That's email? perfect. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great. Okay, okay. I'll do that just in case anyone else has any more questions. And we Absolutely. Do, we do have a question, um, but I'm not sure. It says international students with a question mark. I'm not sure what that means. Oh, do you have any suggestions for marketing to international students? Is the question. This is where you use your social platforms. Um, it's internationally, it's in the US, um, everybody's on social media. So I would encourage you to really post, keep posting. Um, you can also use LinkedIn. That's something that I did not mention. Um, LinkedIn parents are on too. If they're in, you know, any business person usually is on LinkedIn. So you could consider that as a, a way of outreach for people as well. So um, social is going to be key there. Um, and then anything you put on social, make sure you put a link in it back to your website. So a lot of times people will do social posts and they may not put a link in there. Um, Instagram may not let you put a link in the post, I don't think. So just make sure that your um, logo of your school is on there. But Facebook, you can put a link in the post and LinkedIn, you can put in links. So um, social is going to be your best avenue for that out the gate. And then I would also I would also say that um, for us at my school we would do a virtual open house as well for folks who could not um, in attend um, in person and host that and then we would you know host some of the videos from um, the virtual open house on our website you know some of the highlights from our virtual open house on our website so that uh, international folks would have access to that as well. Great, thank you. Excellently answered. And then we have another question. If you don't have marketing slash admission staff, who can you hire to do it for you? There are um, that is, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, that might be a bit expensive to hire someone to do it for you. But as Amber pointed out earlier, um, sometimes either if you have a commission or you have a board and there's a marketing committee or an admissions committee of that commission, you will lean into those folks and have them help you. Any of your parents that are in marketing or in advertising, um, they can help you out as well. We had a parent committee that worked with the marketing team and the admissions team to drive some of the efforts that um, we had. And we, of course, offered them their service hours because we know all of our schools really want our parents to help us out in that way. So we would offer them service hours for sitting on our marketing and admission um, committee. And they, they helped us out greatly with that. That's a great point. If you do have some revenue to be able to spend, I would encourage reaching out to a local university um, either a two-year or a four-year. Kids need credits, which is called students. They need credits um, towards their degree. Um, my son currently is in graphic design in a, at a university, and he volunteers to get hours so that he can show his work and build his portfolio. So surprisingly enough, if you outreach to some of those universities, they'll find students that will volunteer. So that's another way. And they're being trained on it to be their professional career. So it's great for them to show on their resume. And That's if a you great call, pay call them out. even like 10 or $12 an hour, the, the kids will jump at it. That's a great call out. Our um, second grade, one of our second grade teachers had a son who had gone to our school and was in college and he was in um, media production and he would come in and do some of our videos for us. So that was a good way of, of us getting um, a product and him also getting credit for it as well. So, yeah. And I love that alumni. That's perfect. Absolutely. A great, great question. And great answer. Um, we have no more. Oh, never mind. 
we got another one. <laughs> As we use Facebook and Instagram, do you know of any resources to learn how to more effectively use social? Well, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, and like I said, through YouTube, you can find a lot of resources um, just by, you know, searching a term and, and trying to understand it a little bit better. I would say the biggest thing for you in Facebook and social in Instagram specifically is don't just do it once a month. You have to be in front of your audience more often. So to get trained on that, it it's the frequency. So there, anybody that's going to tell you to do things, they're going to say, put a calendar together and it's called a social media calendar. And you basically just map out what you want to post on a daily basis. And a lot of times you can pre put it in there and then it'll just run for you and you can say when it's going to run. Um, so I would check you too. And I can source that for you. If you need help in sourcing that I can uh, get you with a, a great a person that you can follow um, that gives free tips and tricks. So why don't you just put uh, a message out to me and I'll help you find an individual that you can learn some of that from. I'd be more than happy to do that for you guys. And then that can help you set up your page appropriately and, and learn some tips and tricks if, if you're new to it. Great. I did message your email to them privately as okay. well. Um, and any more questions? Um, still have, still have time. It's no problem. Um, and what about the email on the screen? Would would you be okay with them emailing that as well, or do you prefer your personal email? Um, either way. I mean, I get I have access to this email too. So this one on the screen is fine too. Around finding um ways with our our products. Um. We definitely can go through that too. If you have a one-on-one -on -one question for me, why don't you just email me personally? That that'll be great. Shauna too. If you have one something she stated in and you want to learn more about, feel free just to reach out to her as well. We have another comment, not tips, but on Instagram, you can link in bio to get people to use your website, et cetera. Yes, that's a great tip. Um and we got another comment saying, thank you. Great suggestions. Mm -hmm. And we have another one saying, also look up Meta on Facebook to schedule posts only 29 days in advance. Mm -hmm. That's a good tip. So this is interesting, very fruitful. <laughs> so I don't know if we have any more questions, but if you have any other comments, or uh, concerns, I'm sure you, they can reach out to you personally. If we've provided the yes. email in the chat, the correct one. I accidentally misspelled it the first time. I'm You're so sorry. Fine. <laughs> but we will uh, include it, if that's okay with you, in the follow-up email. And um, I also included a, a link to the certificate of completion for this webinar. Uh, we use this to help uh, improve the quality of our services based on member feedback. So if you could please uh, take a look at that and fill that out, it should take no more than five minutes to complete. And please uh, provide your name and email address at the end of the survey in order for you to receive the certificate of completion. And um, it will be sent via automated email. So please check your spam in case sometimes uh, automated emails do get sent to spam, unfortunately. So, um, but again, thank you so much, Amber and Shauna. Thank you for your incredible presentation. Um, it was very fruitful, very interesting. So we appreciate your time here today. And uh, thank you to everyone who joined. Again, if you need any more questions, if you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to Amber and, um, and Shauna. So thank you so much, both of you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. We appreciate you attending. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.